Welcome, welcome everyone. So please type in the chat where you are zooming from and we will get started soon. And just a gentle reminder to please turn your cameras on. As we know, our presenters will love to see your beautiful faces. So in the chat, just let us know where you're zooming from and we are going to get started. So um, good evening, everyone. Uh, we are super excited to have you all here this evening. My name is Dr. Jelana Sheets and I'm the Associate Director of the Aspen Institute Science and Society Program. And I, along with my colleagues, are delighted to welcome you to this month's community talk series hosted by Our Future is Science. This series is part of the mentorship and scholars programs of Our Future is Science. We are also happy to welcome the public as Zoom allows us to democratize these programs. Um, our Future of Science, or OFIS, is a joint initiative between the Aspen Institute Science and Society Program and CODA Societies. As an organization, we are committed to sparking curiosity, passion, and confidence about STEM and young people to push science forward in the 21st century and solve society's most pressing issues. We are generously supported by the Amgen Foundation, the Samueli Foundation, BM, the Rita Allen Foundation, Genentech, the Manitou Fund, and Lida Hill Philanthropies. The, my, the Community Talk Series is a platform to expose individuals to um, diverse careers, as well as information and insights, as well as perspectives on the intersections of STEAM disciplines and social justice issues. So now on to tonight's talks. Tonight, we are honored to have key individuals behind the development or uh, part of the cast of the documentary, The Dark Hobby. It's an expose um, of the devastation to species and reefs caused by the aquarium trade. But before we jump in, uh, we'll share the trailer of the dark hobby. Hassan, if you'll share your screen. This is marine wildlife. This is a Hawaii treasure, and they're stealing it. You need two things to be an aquarium collector in Hawaii. It's a pulse and 50 bucks. At any given moment, there are 27 million live individuals in the aquarium pipeline. Pipeline begins when Hassan, I thought it was just me, but your video was actually not moving. Yeah, it wasn't. Bring it in the chat. Well, what we can do is we can come back to that. <laughs> um, and before I introduce the speaker, I wanna make sure that they're on the call. Is Kaimi on the call? So um, I'm thrilled to introduce our speakers tonight. Uh, we do have Kaimi um, Kapiko. Um, he'll be joining us a bit later, um, but we also have, um, um, Paula um, Faust. She's an award-winning filmmaker. She produced and directed tonight's documentary, The Aquariums, The Dark Hobby, um, along with multiple shows uh, broadcast on PBS, such as Not in God's Name, In Search of Tolerance with the Dalai Lama, and other films. She co-authored um, Shiva and wrote Not in God's Name, featuring an interview with Mother Teresa. And Paula was vice president of KRCA TV in Los Angeles president of Paradise Filmworks International and co-chair of the Southern Asian Art Council at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. Um, and we also have Bill um, Hogsey. Um, he's been nominated for an Oscar for Hoop Dreams and an Emmy for The Last Days of Kennedy and King. Um, he has received the American Cinema Editor's Eddie Award among many other prizes. And Bill's other stellar editing directing works include Stevie, Naked and Ashes, 
and unprecedented. Sunset Story, an IT or independent, um, an ITBS PBS documentary about a residence for retired radicals, won a special jury prize at Tribeca. He worked both um, Orson Welles and John um, Kasevitz, um, editing shorter films. Lastly, Rob Robert Winter is Snorkel Bob, Hawaii's largest reef outfitter. His five marine volumes show reef society and personalities, narrating conservation victories and politics. He is dedicated to reef recovery and the global campaign to ban the aquarium trade. It's all one reef. Winter is um, active in Hawaii's uh, conservation community, uh, working to protect Hawaii's reefs. Um, his books are recognized for excellence and his reef photography volumes include um, Palau, I'm sure I butchered that, <laughs> um, Hawaii, the Great Reef, the Virgin, Fiji, Tahiti, and Cuba. Um, Winter is heard around the world. His novel, in A Sweet Magnolia Time, was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize and a, a Penn Faulkner um, Award. And so we are excited to have our speakers um, here. And um, before we jump into the film, uh, we wanted to get a high level overview um, of uh, the issue of the aquarium train. And so um, our speakers will take that on. Well, I'll, uh -huh. I'll begin. Um, it, it, this was a problem uh, for years. Uh, what makes this problem um, unique among conservation problems is that it's underwater. And under the water, underwater has been under the radar for a long, long time. Uh, the good news is that some caring people were also underwater and saw what was happening. Uh, this, this came together kind of like magic. Uh, the, uh, the legislative uh, push to curb the aquarium trade began in 2007, long time ago. And that first year, um, the, the, the first bill was drafted in the quarter of the Hawaii State Capitol 20 minutes before the deadline for submission and it was hand drafted on a legal pad. And it was just for fun to see who would come out of the woodwork. And we were shocked and amazed that they came out of the woodwork in full force. Uh, all the aquarium collectors representing an industry that claimed an annual revenue of about a million dollars. And there were 40 of them. And no one's gonna sneeze at 50 grand a year, but uh, th this was over the top or maybe it was, I forget the average, it was very low. Uh, and that told us what we were dealing with. The aquarium trade worldwide is about a $5 billion industry. Reef wildlife represents a very small part of that, but they use the wildlife to, uh, to uh, generate demand for the, the, the hardware, the tank stands, lights, uh, gravel, filtration, all that. And um, the salient uh, facts of the situation are 27, to, as, the, as the movie begins, 27 to 28 million individual reef wildlife critters are in the aquarium pipeline at all times. Average mortality is about 99% within a year of capture, and all those dead critters demand replacement. That's what the aquarium trade calls sustainable. Uh, the, the legislative effort went on and on and on. Then came the executive uh, level of government in Hawaii. Uh, the last three administrations have been corrupt, beginning with uh, the um, Linda Lingle campaign. Her chief of staff was an aquarium wholesaler, so we couldn't get anything going then. After that was Neil Abercrombie. His director of land and natural resources was a licensed aquarium collector. He fought tooth and nail to defend the trade in Hawaii. And this most recent administration, the Ige, was pitiful. The DLNR director was the ex-director of the Nature Conservancy. Please do not donate to the Nature Conservancy. They have fought tooth and nail to protect commercial ocean extraction around the world. We now have a new administration. How will it work out remains to be seen. In the meantime, a woman from, from California and, and Las Vegas came to Hawaii and visited Snorkel Bob's and went snorkeling and had the gumption, and I should call it, you know, gumption is a good thing. She also had the care in her heart and in her brain to return her gear to Snorkel Bob's and say, I don't get it, where are the fish? And they said, you should call Robert. And she said, Robert, who? And, and so that's how it came to pass. In the meantime, 
Kaimi Kaupiko, who I hope joins us in a, in a few minutes, lives on the far southern end of the Kona Coast. The Kona Coast is 140 miles of uninterrupted coral cover. Kaimi knows, he knows the ocean, he's, he, he's a waterman and, and he's Hawaiian, and he knows this problem. They have come into his village and they have, they have done what they shouldn't do. It's off limits, it's illegal, but they do it anyway. Putting all these things together, Paula put together the film crew and brought it to Hawaii. Uh, and among the crew was Bill Hogsey, who, who worked his magic to, to, to edit all these seemingly disparate parts into a movie, The Dark Hobby, that has now been seen all over the world. It's gotten beautiful results. Who knew? And I have to say that, you know, speaking of, of, of heart, heartfelt motivation, the Snorkel Bob crew took these trips for years to all over the world, to, to, to the best reefs we could imagine, to, to capture what was there before it's gone. We did not have this movie in mind, but when this movie came to pass, all this footage, it, it came to the world to show what we're fighting for. And I have to give hats off again to Paula and Bill uh, for the magic they made. Many conservation movies uh, default to the gore and the ugliness and the misfortune and the sadness. This one defaults to beauty. This is the reason we campaign. This is what we have to, to, to campaign for. This struggle will not go away in our lifetimes. And, and, and I don't use that phrase, that, that, that phrase loosely. I'm much older than most of the viewing audience and, and the panel, a couple of exceptions, uh, but it's ongoing. You, 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 want, you want to protect something in the world we live in, you better make it a, 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 a fun outing because it, you know, um, fatigue is, is the biggest challenge to any conservation work. And I, I'm just grateful for, the, for what came together here. It's, it's been a lot of fun and, and we're meeting the challenge. Thank you so much for that. Um, Paula or Bill, do you have any additional comments? Um, Not at this point for me, I don't know. Okay. Yeah, I thought that was an excellent over, overview. Uh, it was a great project to be involved in. For us, I can speak for Bill too, I think about this, that we didn't know a lot about the ocean or about reef wildlife. And I feel that we were really impressed by the dedication of the unbelievable people we met whom I call eco heroes, eco conservationists who just are heroic and how hard they worked to try to protect these beautiful reef creatures. Thank you. So what we'll do before we go wait, into, wait, wait. oh, go ahead. Uh, <clears throat> I, I guess I did want to say one little thing, which is, you know, this was my first, doing this trip was my first time in, in Hawaii and I came away absolutely you know so affected by what we saw well I, I just want to say that I am a total total fan of Robert Wintner for um, for what he's done for these animals and the passion of his caring for these animals and sharing about these animals to all the rest of us and of course great, grateful to Paula for producing the film and for all this being together. But Robert, I just want you to know how much I appreciate you. Thanks, Bill. I do too. I think we fixed our tech, uh, our tech difficulties. And so um, Hassan is gonna share the trailer. All right, everybody keep their fingers crossed with me. Let's double check and make sure this will work. Now the sound doesn't have a sound. <laughs> Sounds like we are underwater. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's never perfect. This is such a unsharing, resharing. All right, third time's the charm, right? Something like that. Sure. 
This is marine wildlife. This is a Hawaii dragon, and they're stealing it. You need two things to be an aquarium collector in Hawaii. All right, it is not working again. We're getting Zoom quit. It's going to kill me soon, so I'm sorry, guys. I'll put it in the chat, though. Yes, and the great news is that I think most people have watched it. Um, and so um, I think uh, I think we're good. Thank you, Hassan, for trying to facilitate that. And yeah, thank you so much to like Paula and Bill and Robert for all of those wonderful insights on such an important topic that clearly has implications all the way from the individual to the policy level. And so with that, we'll now transition to the Q&A portion of today's uh, community talk. So myself, Sejal, and my colleague Hassan will uh, moderate. And so just to give a little context, we asked the OFIS community of mentors, mentees, scholars, and ambassadors to submit questions for our panelists after watching the documentary. And so these questions will form the basis of our Q&A tonight, but um, definitely go ahead and input questions in the chat as we go along. Um, maybe you'll get inspired by someone else's question and we'd love to hear from all of you if possible. So our first question is from one of our mentees, Sinoja, who asks, when I first saw aquariums, I thought of the aquarium attractions that you go to. I think that's something that a lot of us are familiar with. And so do those aquariums also have this kind of effect on reefs and underwater ecosystems? They yes, do. So so Go ahead, Paul. I was just going to say that uh, apparently the public aquariums all have to get the fish from somewhere. So a great deal, a great percentage of the fish that are brought into the United States and imported from many areas around the world, such as the Philippines, Malaysia, Indonesia, they are caught with cyanide and when the uh, catchers go out and they kind of put the cyanide in, in big pumps and spray it onto the fish, and then the fish are just absolutely collapsing, and a lot of them die. And 90% of them, when they reach the United States, they have um, poisoning. They have jaundice, and a lot of them, their eyes turn yellow. So just like a home aquarium hobbyist, the uh, public aquariums are also getting the fish in this way. Is that right, Robert? Yeah. And, um, you know, politically speaking, uh, the first few years we began the uh, legislative campaign, uh, we were willing to give special dispensation to these aquarium attractions that you've referenced. And they fought tooth and nail against every bill we presented year in, year out in the Hawaii legislature. And uh, that was the AZA, the uh, Association of Zoos and Aquariums. And they, uh, you know, pretty well healed and they could afford lobbyists and, and a lot of campaigning. The reason for that is they need the collectors to do their dirty work. Uh, the collectors are often in poor countries. Uh, they get paid pennies on the dollar. And as Paula said, most of the fish are compromised with uh, cyanide. They also use dynamite. Uh, after they poison or blast a reef, they collect all the floaters uh, and they wait. And those that come around, they ship off. Those that don't come around, they throw over. And, and again, they get pennies on the dollar. But that's why we learned the hard way that these aquarium attractions, it, it, if it wasn't for collectors around the world and this whole system they have set up of transport and massive mortality, all these aquarium attractions would have to put together their own capture expeditions and it would be cost prohibitive and they would go out of business. Better that the aquarium exhibits go out of business because it's bad business for us and for reefs around the world. Thank you for that, very insightful. And I'll pass it over to Hassan to ask the next question. All right, can you hear me now? Yep, we're good. Okay, cool, sorry. So the second question is from another mentee named Trinity. 
So in the documentary, we see many laws and regulations go through different areas of Hawaii's state government when it comes to the commercial collecting of aquarium fish. Outside of Hawaii, are there any national laws or regulations against collecting aquarium fish? And is it really being in, enforced? The, the short answer is no. Um, th there were a couple of moves afoot in recent years, but they did not materialize. Uh, one of them was uh, under uh, management from uh, Daniel Inouye's office, the late Daniel Inouye. He was a U.S. Senator in Hawaii. Uh, I was never optimistic about that initiative uh, because it meant to uh, appease everyone. And, and this is kind of a, a, a zero sum game. The aquarium trade needs to cease in all aspects. Uh, and and that, that's, it's, it, it, it's a tough challenge, but that's what we have. Uh, no more ocean extraction. The, uh, when I mentioned that the Nature Conservant Conservancy before, their cry for years has been, it's sustainable, it's sustainable, but they've never defined sustainability. We define sustainability as an acceptable level of destruction. Earth is now pushing 9 billion human beings and the pressure is on nature, on, on wilderness, habitat and species everywhere. And this is no different and it's not sustainable. They can't spell sustainable. Uh, and so, you know, the long and short of it is, I think they had um, five key groups that were going to be in a round table. Daniel Inouye passed away and this thing came to naught. Uh, but the, the short answer is no, there's no federal regulation other than uh, there's CITES, which is the conservation on international trade of endangered species that should come into play. Most of the trade is domestic um, that, that we're concerned about. Um, there's, there's another um, slice that's pretty recent and pretty uh, relevant uh, that um, the biggest trans shipper in Hawaii is in Oahu and he applied to get his lease renewed on warehouse space very near the airport last week. This was the first hearing of the Board of Land and Natural Resources in Hawaii, and he got tabled because a couple of people uh, testified against him. He's a Chinese national. His name is Richard Z. It's spelled X-I-E. On his website, he had two services that I found particularly unsavory. One is um, he offered a service where if you came to Hawaii and hired his company, they would take you diving to capture your own reef wildlife and ship it back to your home where so you could put it in your aquarium. And then the other was a Chinese dating service. And I won't belabor the details on that, but you get the picture. Next question. Really interesting. And yeah, so on the topic of those like recent events and just kind of the legal side of this issue. Um, we have a question from one of our mentors, Cole, who's wondering, you know, are there any legislative updates with the new session that started in 2023? And, you know, in the documentary, we follow along some of the legal battles that are taking place. So have there, has there been any movement on those in 20? Um, no, the, the legislature opens today as we speak, and that's mostly just a glad hand, glad hand, how do you do, aloha session, a meet and greet. Um, I think there will be a new bill in the legislature. Um, there are several things in play. Uh, I'm not at liberty to expose them right now. I promise you, uh, the aquarium trade is watching this program. Uh, it's what they do. And, 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 and we remain optimistic. This, this campaign will continue. I pledge that. All right, thank you. So I have another question. This one, we're switching gears a little bit. We're going back to main questions about the aquarium. So Zoe, one of our mentees, she has a related question. Do similar problems exist in freshwater hobbies? So would it be better if hobbyists bred and bought captive bred fish? In regards to fish living in boxes, would it be better if general guidelines to caring for fish were updated to be scientifically accurate and more ethical? When we made the film and we interviewed a lot of people on this issue about freshwater fish, as opposed to uh, the fish that are taken out of the ocean saltwater, a lot of people felt that 
it was better because it wasn't uh, affecting the oceans, but also people have the feeling that because it's still an animal who has a sentient being who has feelings and because there's so much science nowadays that uh, scientific research nowadays that's discovering what in intelligent animals they are that it's also not good to keep you know even freshwater fish in glass tanks so there is a back and forth on the issue I think that if there was new information out about how to take care of the fish, it would probably be very helpful to update it. Thank you. Yeah, I'll, and so I'll from add, that conversation, that, oh, sorry, go ahead. I'll just add briefly to that. I've always felt that freshwater aquariums are a gateway hobby. Most aquarium keepers begin with freshwater and then go to salt. Beyond that, uh, there's really uh, mixed arguments on captive bred versus wild caught. And um, right now there's about 2 million home aquariums in the world. The aquarium trade and the aquarium hobby is all about greenwashing. Uh, many aquarium keepers will brag, I, but 30% of my inmates are captive bred or 40 or 80. If they are allowed to greenwash, the captive breeding makes this an acceptable hobby. That number of aquariums worldwide will go from 2 million to 5 million. It's cool. It's a cool thing to do and it doesn't hurt anything, but it does hurt things. It's killing reefs worldwide and reefs worldwide are under tremendous pressure. The aquarium trade says we don't, we don't apply that pressure. That pressure is, is warming, it's, it's effluent, it's other toxins, and we don't do it, but they do that. They're one of the big adverse pressures on reef wildlife and habitat today. They destroy wildlife and, and habitat during the process. Uh, I, I hate to go on and on. Uh, fire Carl is a good example, uh, but um, next question. Yeah, um, so from both the documentary itself and the conversation that we've been having thus far, I think it's a pretty clear like call to action for the aquarium trade and the hobby to come to an end. And so um, one of our mentors, Audra, is wondering, you know, if aquarium collection does end, what does the path to recovery look like for the ecosystem? Is that even something that's possible at this point? And we also have a question in the chat wondering, like, what are your thoughts on aquariums or institutions that um, like hold fish captive for like reproductive and repopulation reasons? Um, the, the, the ocean is, is remarkably resilient, um, and, and you can't watch the news on any given day in our lifetime without seeing warnings that time is running out, and time is running out. Um, I, I have faith in the ocean. We have, here in Hawaii, we had, well, especially on the island of Maui, we had aquarium pressure. There weren't that many of them. They're gone now. Maui is no ka'oi. It's the best because we ran them out of town. But when they were here, you know, you've all heard of, and, and, and the movie, uh, Bill and Paula covered this beautifully on the lionfish invasion of, of the Caribbean and the Atlantic seaboard. It was a huge catastrophe. Uh, and lionfish, that's a general term. There's several species involved. Among those species are the Hawaii lionfish and the Hawaii turkey fish. Our apex predators keep them in check, keep them in control. We used to see them all the time, uh, beautiful critters. We didn't see them for years because the aquarium hunters wiped them out. Now the aquarium trade is gone. It's been gone from Maui for 12 years and we see them again. And they're the most beautiful critters you can imagine. So I think that what we called gone for many years, they went deep, they went to other places, they hid, they will come back. Uh, but you know, time is running out and, and, and it needs to stop. Yeah, I just saw a news story uh, yesterday, I believe, that sharks and rays are really in danger of extinction and that on the world's reefs, 20% of sharks are missing already. So that's, that's a bit worrisome for sure. And uh, actually the article said that it is a race against time as far as protecting sharks because a shark fin soup 
the demand is so high for that in China. When we did the film, which was a couple years ago already, it said 100 million sharks a year were being killed for shark fin soup. So that's probably even more now. And again, you know, in the dark hobby, um, we, we covered that, Paul covered it beautifully at Jardines de la Reina in Cuba. Jardines de la Reina was the most active fishing area in Cuba. And it got fished out and it got left for dead. It was a boneyard. It, this is all in the dark hobby. And if you saw the movie, you'll remember this. Uh, and, and they took the sharks first because of huge demand. And, and they ate their sharks. Sharks were their protein staple in Cuba. They ate them. And it was a boneyard. It was dead. And when Fidel Castro, say what you will, when he said, no mas on the sharks, it took a few years and they returned and the ecosystem restored itself. 100% biodiversity, uh, optimal apex predators, and 100% coral cover. It can happen, but we can't take it for granted. It has to happen now. That's great. Well, on, this, on that note of acting now, we do have a question from Raquel in our chat from one of our mentors. So in order to help conservation efforts, should we stop supporting these institutions? And what can we do to help those efforts from where we are? Yeah, as I, as I said earlier, the biggest challenge any any conservation work, especially in a campaign this long, is fatigue. It, it, it affects morale, it affects your outlook on life, and you have to avoid it. If you start getting depressed, and, and everybody does, it's a natural thing, you got to take a break. You got to do something fun. You got to get away from it for a little while so you can refresh. It's just like a boxer between rounds. You let the blood get back into your brain and you, and you catch your breath. Uh, it, it's the same syndrome, uh, but I think that, um, you know, what can you do? You can't take it personally, everything you see. I see horrible stuff all the time. I don't take it personally. I do what I can. If I'm out and I see an aquarium in a commercial place, I have a word with management. I won't spend money there, but I will let them know in an aloha way. I used to speak to a lot of kids groups and I say, kids, you know, you don't have to make a scene unless you think it would be effective. And then, yeah, by all means, make a scene. I used to tell the school kids that and they loved it, that, you know, because that's what kids are good at and kids can be effective and kids get it. Believe me, kids get it today more than ever before. The kids today have a harder time than ever before because look what they're walking into. Come on. Uh, you tend to think it'll take care of itself. It won't. You talk about the, the, the demand in Asia. Asia's not going to change. Humanity's not going to change. I mean, call me a cynical some bitch because I am, because I've seen what's happening in the world. There's no, I heard a guy say, well, there's no political will. No political will. There's no human will, you know? Uh, and so a correction will come. And in the meantime, we fight the good fight. Thank you. I'll pass it on to Sage for the next question. Yeah, I'd love to, um, on this next question, get all of our panelists' perspectives, especially Bill, you know, as such a award-winning filmmaker. But a question that's on a lot of our minds after seeing such an amazing documentary, um, and this question comes from one of our mentees, Radhika, like, what was the hardest part about filming and creating this documentary? You know, I can imagine there's challenges both in terms of putting together the actual documentary, but also distributing it and making sure that it's heard in the appropriate channels. Bill, do you want to answer that question? I'll take a little hack at that. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, you know, uh, I guess, I guess uh, the thing that first pops in my head about this film is that the beauty of the fish and the way that they move and the whole thing of the underwater view of all that is so, uh, anyway, to me, it was so uh, attractive, so alluring that it was, I really wanted to use, all I wanted to do was see those fish the whole, you know, hour. I could have watched those fish the whole time. And I was really uh, attracted, oh, I don't know, I just was attracted so much, so much of the time to the, the beauty of those fish. I mean, in a way, I guess that served at least my allegiance to the purpose of the film because the beauty is there. Um, but I found out that we had, when we found out more and more and more about what was going on and the causes of 
the savagery which is going on against those animals, th then I became much more interested in that. Uh, that's my first hit on problem. Just the beauty itself, and it's possible distracting away from the, the social and, and ecological purpose is the problem that I'm kind of thinking of. But there are probably other things. Somebody else, Paula? Well, one thing to note is that the Hawaiian culture is so connected to the ocean and to the beauty of nature. And we got to be around people like uh, Kimakeo Kapalehuahua and uh, Willie Kaupiko, who's a mayor of Mililihi. We got to see and to feel through the eyes of the Hawaiians themselves who shared with us how meaningful um, the fish are to their culture. I mean, how can you live on an island and not be dependent on, you know, all the life in the water all around you? So that was really a big part of the film that we wanted to express. And we also got to meet other activists from Hawaii. But uh, besides the nature, the spiritual aspect, um, Gail Grabowski, uh, the marine biologist, she speaks about it in the film, how the great um, northern part of the Hawaiian Islands that are a marine preserve, that to her, she really feels its importance to the Hawaiian people and to the whole earth because it represents a very special part of nature right now that is intact. And hopefully that will be increasing, you know, the amount of wildlife there that is safe and uh, hopefully less and less trash will be arriving on, on the beach, you know, as the waves roll in. But um, we really were taken, I would say, I think you're probably agree, Bill, just with the feelings when we were working on the film that the connection of the nature with the Hawaiian people, it was a really big part of it. Okay, great. So I have a follow-up question. <clears throat> so with this block that we're working on now for students, we're talking about science and storytelling. So a big reason why all of you are here is helping us help our students find new ways to interpret and explain some of the things that they're working on. So a lot of our students are working currently on capstone projects that they'll produce and they'll showcase at the end of the semester. I wanted to know from all of you, what conversations were had around the framing of this documentary at the beginning and how much of that was consistent at the end? That's interesting. Um, Bill, do you want to speak about that? I know we had very different scenes and we were trying to find the balance between the science and as Bill was talking about the beauty. And I think that everyone in the audience can see that uh, Robert Whitner just knows so much about the whole topic. He's a fountain of uh, knowledge. And to get all of the scientific facts in there without boring the audience, right? Like when you go to see a movie, you want to be uh, entertained. You want to experience the beauty. And yet at the same time, we had to relay a lot of information to make the film work. So I think that was a balance that was tricky. Thank yeah. Um, <laughs> it just occurs to me to have something else to say about that. I don't think, I'm not sure this is coming in exactly the right place, but uh, as the film went on, um, you know, we turned, I, I turned my attention more and more to the savagery of the commercial, I was going to say capitalist, but let's just say commercial people in this particular situation. The, the story that, you know, that Robert uh, shows so well about the number of animals that are in the pipeline, the percentage of them that die, and the whole thing is leading to the to the decimation of the whole population of these animals. And it's, it just makes you, it made me real mad. And in a, in a new way from, I mean, I had never really experienced that before about tropical fish. I mean, what, you know, tropical fish, but, but the, the way Robert's uh, you know, research has it and the, what we found in, in doing the film is that, yeah, 
it's they'll and it's sort of what we're doing with the whole world, isn't it? Just just smashing it around, even though and sort of hoping that it won't all die away. I, I really felt that we came right straight up against that crucial fact. We're destroying it. And pretty soon there won't be any fish to see. There won't be any reason to come from Maui or other Hawaiian Islands. I don't, that's that that I it, it sparked greater anger and anger in me at this at the commercial exploitation of these animals. And, and and related to the other ecological disasters around us every day. Thank you very much. And that, can I just mention one other thing about the film that was quite difficult and it had to be the spine of the film. And that was the whole layer of the many, many political campaigns that went on for what, Robert, 13, 14 years? 16. 16. And even at the end of the film, then all of a sudden something else would happen, you know, like the fish were protected and then suddenly um, it was all allowed to lapse, even though the fight had gone all the way to the Supreme Court and was won. And then suddenly it was allowed to lapse. So we had to communicate in some kind of way to keep the audience, you know, interested, this struggle, this political struggle that's going on and on and still still is. Yeah, thank you very much. Those are really fascinating considerations, um, especially considering, you know, thinking about how this is playing out over time. And as Bill mentioned, I think a big piece of what makes this such a difficult issue to tackle is like the economic and commercial aspect of this trade. And one of our mentees, Cassian, is wondering what economic or like other incentives or deterrents have actually been successful in preventing collectors from harvesting fish from these reefs? I used to say uh, facetiously that they're all the collectors. It, and the collectors are really the, the bottom rung of the aquarium totem. They are the grunt labor. And as I say, many of them are from very poor countries working for pennies on the dollar. In Hawaii, they're making big dough because, well, many of them dive three times a day. It's not easy. It's hard. Uh, and they are expert divers. And I, and I often facetiously say, if they would just take a couple of semesters at Miss Manners School of Etiquette, they could get jobs in tourism. They're good divers, uh, but they don't want to. They want the easy money. Uh, and it's, it's diving for dollars with the aquarium trade. And there's, for the last eight years, the, the recent administration here, there's been zero enforcement. The Department of Land and Natural Resources with the approval of the Nature Conservancy and the guidance of the Nature Conservancy condones, protects, defends, and promotes the aquarium trade in Hawaii. As far as trans shipping from Indonesia, uh, uh, the Philippines, um, it's just, it's, just um, it's, it's open trade. And we hope that's gonna change here in the near future. Uh, thanks especially to Bill Hogsey for getting pissed off you know, that, that's a stage of grief. And we're all in grief seeing what's happening to nature. And then comes, I'm not going to say acceptance of the situation, but acceptance of the struggle before us. And that's the point. You know, what's the point of anything? The point of this program of sharing these thoughts is to put this in your mind, to plant some little seeds and stay pissed off and do something. You don't have to make a scene unless you think it's going to be effective. I've done it plenty. And here we are. And the public, you know, the general public needs to know what's happening to reef wildlife. So the whole purpose of us making the dark hobby uh, in the vein of films like Blackfish and The Cove, those films really effected change. And we would like to see more people knowing about what's happening to reef wildlife and realizing how reef wildlife participates in creating 50% of the oxygen for our planet and how important caring for the reefs and the reef wildlife is. So that is really the reason why we've gone to this trouble of making the film and we're doing our best to distribute it as much as we can. 
Thank you. So I, I wanted to touch a little bit on the aspects of, you know, that you brought up grief and anger and anxiety about, we all know what's happening, we're aware of what's happening, but the ability for us to change that or make a change, that's where a lot of people falter or like fall or see the massive wave and, you know, succumb to it, right? So my question for any one of you who would want to chime in on it is, how do you channel that energy, not just in the creation of something like this, but now that it's created, how do you amplify that? You're looking for an audience. A lot of our mentees and mentors will be looking for audiences around their ideas and their topics. So how do you channel that in a way that is productive for you, but you also are making things productive for those involved? I think you're talking about um, imagination. If you can imagine something, it can come to pass. I'm not saying that it will. You have, you know, I'm well known in Hawaii. Paula Faust and Bill Haugsey are well known in, in showbiz. And someone made a reference before to, 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 to some of the viewers here working on things. Consider us, and I hope I'm not <laughs> volunteering for my friends, Bill and Paula, consider us resources. Make contact, do what you need to do, make contact, ask for uh, advice, support, guidance, whatever. Uh, and then the simple things, uh, when you walk into a, a, a bistro or an office or anywhere or a friend's home and you see an aquarium, say something. Say, do you, do you realize many people for many years thought that those fish were coming from somewhere. People were making those fish. They're not. They're coming from the wild and it just won't do. Offer alternatives. They say, if a kid is bad, you don't say to that kid, don't do this. You offer an alternative. We have flat screen TVs. This all is pointed out in the dark hobby. Flat screen TVs, reef cam, you name it. Uh, wildlife, capturing wildlife for entertainment is a non-starter. It's over. It's over. My friends give me grief sometimes when I go overboard and say that, uh, you know, don't do, don't take anything from the ocean. They say that's extreme. That's ridiculous. We live in an extreme time. It's time to give the ocean a rest. It's time to nurture and heal. Uh, and so I say, if you, if you got this in your mind, maybe it'll, it'll fade away, maybe not, maybe you'll see something to wake it back up again, but just stay alert, stay thinking, stay reflective, and uh, it'll, it'll come to you what to do. Maybe it already has, and, and seek help where you need it. We all stand on the shoulders of others. And be sure to tell everyone that these small, beautiful fish that are being caught for the aquarium trade, the work they do there, eating the algae that's growing on the coral, they are helping create more oxygen for the planet than the entire Amazon rainforest. I mean, that is remarkable. So when people hear that, they go, you're kidding me. And you know that can kind of spread like wildfire. That's a good thing for people to know how important these fish are, to leave them at home on the reef. Thank you very much. I'm just checking the time. I just wanted to put out another like call for anyone who has questions, so definitely be sure to drop those in the chat as we go along. Um, and on top of that, that yeah, David McGuire has been putting in a lot of really useful yeah. information in the chat. Before we end, definitely give it a look if you haven't been already. We do have time for maybe a couple more questions. I'll ask one from one of our mentors. So at what point do we as humans collectively place more importance on our natural resources rather than the profit from them? This is from Gerald, one of our mentors. I don't, I, I don't think that's ever going to happen. That Sorry, be, <laughs> yeah. plain and simple, that's pretty good. I, I believe that a lot of the population of human beings on the planet right now understand how important all of this is once they know about it, once they get to know about it. And so that's where we come in, mm -hmm. you know, being able to communicate these issues. They're very important issues. But, but I think the more salient point here is this. We're not going to correct everything all at once. It cannot happen. That's why it's important to pick your battles, stay focused, pick your campaign, make one little difference at a time, 
When you make that little difference, you can go to the next little difference. Uh, you, you, you remind me of this interesting tale that I'm, I'm going to share. Uh, Kaimi's not here. Uh, he and I were together at a hearing uh, on the Big Island in Hilo. And these aquarium guys are arrogant. They're presumptuous and they're arrogant. And one of the aquarium guys got up and testified, you guys in Mililii, all you do is, is, is bitch and moan and complain, and we don't take Opelu. Opelu is a fish about, let me get my screen here. Opelu is a fish about this long, and that's their major catch in Mililii. Mililii is off the grid, by the way, FYI. Mililii is the last working fishing village in Hawaii. This is, is not, uh, uh, it's, it's not sustenance, it's subsistence. They need this to survive. And the Apili Opelu have to come in every year, but they won't if the coral is fuzzy. What keeps the coral from being fuzzy? Yellow tangs. And the aquarium guys come in and catch the yellow tangs, take them away, the coral gets fuzzy, and the opelu don't come in. Mm. That, that, so this is the, don't, you know, this question is a little bit skewed and it's a little bit misleading. How can we solve this huge problem in the world? We can't. That's mm. why I say I don't think it's going to happen. We got to take it one little chink at a time and then we drive hard and you fix that one little thing, you know. Uh, and, and, and with the aquarium trade, we'll end it and then we'll go to the next one. And, and that's, I think you, you have to have that kind of focused thinking to accomplish anything. Uh, and, and that's where we are. Thank you. <clears throat> I think one more question kind of in this vein, but let's try to like narrow it down a little bit more rather than focusing on when we can change and move things forward. If we're looking at right now today, there's a few ambassadors in the chat and in the room who ambassadors are folks who were mentors or mentees previously. We've already talked about things like greenwashing. I was very happy that you brought that up. Uh, we also are talking now about systems thinking and how these problems aren't just happening in isolation. They're happening as a, a piece, a cog in a machine that's much bigger. So if you wanted to expand from not just um, aquariums, but also thinking maybe like SeaWorld and things like this in the country that are massive in terms of the money that they bring in and the tourist attractions that come in. How do you approach those two different worlds? Is it the same saying, you know, what's wrong in the aquariums is wrong on a large scale too? Or is it something that you tailor your approach differently depending on who you're battling or what? Yeah, kind of a similar question, but once you like produce an output how do you go about sort of identifying what the next avenues are you know if you're taking it one step at a time where do those related pieces start to fit in well uh, there was there's someone who uh, works at one of the biggest aquariums in the united states and she saw the dark hobby a few weeks ago and she wrote to me and she said that she was really, really a great fan of the film. It really moved her. It made her remember when she was young and studying uh, marine biology and first working in big public aquariums, that when the fish would arrive, that upon arrival, many of them were dead. And that's how they learned to be able to identify the fish because they'd see these little fish and be able to work with them. So that was interesting because I know when we made the dark hobby, we heard about, you know, we interviewed someone who had worked in fish stores and had found that happening. But those big, large um, aquariums, public aquariums that are places of entertainment as well as education, that's something that it's it's like a different segment than the home aquarium uh collectors who are hobbyists uh, if, if i could add just something from that you know uh, i think you ask you know how, how does it all fit in and uh paula made reference to uh, blackfish and then there's also the cove the thing that impressed me most uh about the cove you all know uh, rick berry early in life he uh, was in the tv series flipper it predates some of you uh it was a 
situational weekly program. And um, I saw an interview with Rick Barry, and he said that maybe it was in, in um, the Cove uh, when he said, in those years, I got a new Porsche every year. That was my value system. And, you know, and I'm, I, I, I don't really have any criticism at all for anyone who drives any kind of car. Uh, but at the end of the movie, here was this man, Rick Berry, and he had a flat screen TV on a, many of you saw the movie, hanging off his neck. And he was at the United Nations. And then again, he was in a busy thoroughfare in Japan, uh, showing the cove and the slaughter that happens there. What do you do? There's some imagination for you. And it can't get any simpler than that. You hang a flat screen TV over your head with a battery pack and you go stand somewhere. There you go. Now, Rick Barry didn't need to make a living at that point. Many of you do, but it's just by way of example, open your mind, open your heart, let's get it done. Uh, and it, it is all tied together. That's why I say one chink at a time. Next thing you know, things open up. Thank you so much for that, Robert. And really thank you to all of you. Um, you know, it's not every day that you get to see like a conversation from the screen come alive. And for those of you who haven't yet had a chance to watch The Dark Hobby, definitely encourage all of you to go see it. Really impactful film. And with that, I will go ahead and pass it over to Ebony to close us out. So thank you. Um, this has been an incredible and important talk. We are grateful to Paula, William, and Robert for spending this evening with us and to our audience. We wanna extend um, our appreciation to our, extend your appreciation to our speakers in the chat. So please do that. And thank you all for attending this community talk. Please visit our website, ourfuturescience.org and follow us on social media to learn about our initiative, future events, and our educational campaign. So we have dropped our attendance form for our mentors and mentees and ambassadors and our um, social media handles in the chat. Thank you very much. And with that, I'll say good night. Good night. Aloha. Aloha, Thank you. everybody. Good night, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you.